you're worshiping with us here at New Hope this morning. If you would, please stand. We're going to open the service singing the Lord's Prayer. Oh, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver. Let your kingdom come, Father. Let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Oh, Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. Forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, the kingdom, the the glory are yours it's yours it's yours all yours all yours forever and ever the kingdom is yours it's yours it's yours all yours all yours the kingdom the power the glory Right here in my heart, oh Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart, on earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart. You may be seated. Uh, good morning, New Hope. Um, I'm filling in for announcements this morning. Uh, I'd like to draw attention to the, your bulletin this morning. Uh, we've got the Easter egg refills that are going on now. We also have the uh, uh, new prayer request uh, slips that are going in back there on the, the table in the back room. Um, also, remember, First Thursday group is meeting on uh, March, uh, well, that's already passed. Anyway, um, so annual Easter egg hunt is coming up on the 27th. And then also we have our missions moment in there to draw your attention to. Um, with that, I'm going to read um, some scripture, and then we'll open up with a word of prayer. And it's Psalm 23, it says, A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Lord, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for this church. Father, I just pray that as we lift our lift you up in worship this morning, that you would um, bless our hearts and our minds. Father, help us to uh, learn more from you and from each other on how we can serve you better. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, who makes all things possible. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.
hearts fall short I got nothing new How could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah and I know it's not much but I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah i've got one response i've got just one move with my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah oh come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song because you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song because you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. Except for a heart singing Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Now 
Now don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those hungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I am nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing I'll stand up if you stand up. That was our conversation. <laughs> and I think I have figured out the blue lights. They are of Satan. <laughs> they come from below. They flash and interrupt things. Those are the satanic lights. That <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't mess with the people up there. All right. Aren't you, is happy spring break? Aren't you glad you're not in Florida? <laughs> Sitting under some 80 degree sun with white sand under your feet, watching the surf in front of you. We're lucky people to still be here, aren't we? We've actually got people, we've got people in Italy, right? And England and Paris and everywhere else and Hawaii there's sheets like this available up here when you go out and back there this is the community public service information regarding the eclipse we were gonna plan an event here at New Hope during the eclipse and then we started hearing all the horror stories and uh, possibility of internet being down because of overload and people in the streets and it's the apocalypse everyone but we decided against it but it is I mean it's good to to think through what you might face it may be much less than what's threatened but uh, uh, anyway, we may have uh, one or two of our officers, police officers stand up, or Bundick chaplain, stand up here in the, uh, one of the next couple of, couple of Sundays and talk through that just a little bit. But just keep, keep that in mind. And then, uh, the only other thing I want to mention is my wife gave me this note when I sat down. And she said, March, was it 33 years ago that we came to New Hope? Best decision I ever let you make, is what she said. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing about that, I'm not sure I'm the one that made it, but that's good. <laughs> Stand if you would, we've got a great reading for your spring break from the Gospel of John chapter 6 on the front of your bulletin and on the screens too. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. 
For I have come down from heaven to do my will, not to do my will, but to do the will of the one of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Stay seated, I mean, stay standing for just a second and recite with me the line from the Lord's Prayer that we want to talk about today. Give us this day our daily bread. And now you may be seated. We're approaching Easter here at New Hope. We're approaching Easter uh, this year by way of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Each Sunday, getting a little bit deeper into the Lord's Prayer. And today we come to the shortest and what seems to be the simplest line in the prayer, the the request for daily bread. Or is it simple? A version of the Lord's Prayer appears in two Gospels. It appears in Matthew. Uh, and it's, there it's a part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and it's preceded by the story of the hypocrite who stands up to pray in public on the streets or in the synagogues to be seen by people. In Luke's Gospel, a shorter uh, version of the Lord's Prayer appears, and it's in a slightly different context. After observing Jesus at prayer, Uh, One of Jesus' disciples says, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. That's always struck me as a surprising request because here we have Jewish fellows who have grown up in the heartland of Judaism in Judea and Galilee. And a halfway expect Jesus to say to them, what, didn't your mothers teach you anything, right? Uh, It's debated today whether Jewish uh, daily prayer cycles were widely established in the time of Jesus. That's called Second Temple Judaism. But here's the thing. It is inconceivable that Jesus' followers wouldn't have known some of the basics of prayer and wouldn't have been practicing it. It's inconceivable. So what's being sought there? I think the clue is in the second half of the request. Teach us to pray just as John, John the Baptist, taught his disciples. They evidently knew something about the prayer life of the baptizers community. And we don't know what that is, what was special about John the Baptist's disciples and their prayers, but they seem to have known something. And it was not unusual for rabbis to pass on to their followers, their apprentices, uh, particular prayers or particular ways of praying. So I think it's important that Jesus doesn't respond to their request by saying, don't you know that prayer is practiced by all human cultures, that human beings, well, we're all hardwired for prayer. Instead, Jesus says, say this. And he gives them actual words, a prayer appropriate for anyone who wants to be the apprentice of this particular rabbi, Jesus. Address God in intimate terms. He starts off, address him as father, but as a father who is in heaven and so other than us and greater than us. Have as your guiding notion of the prayer what was the primary focus of Jesus' ministry, and that is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or the reign of God. Always in your prayer, pray for his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth. 
And today, well, it looks like we get away from all the complicated theology stuff and get down to basics. Give us our daily bread. The simplest of requests, or is it? Because there is bread, small b, and there is bread, capital B. So what exactly is it that we're praying for when we pray this? There's been a, a, a disagreement on that question from the very beginning, it seems like. Uh, John Chrysostom, who was writing in the fourth century, thought it should be read, that line of the prayer should be read as material bread. He says, here Jesus is speaking to people who have natural needs of the flesh, who are subject to the necessities of nature. He does not pretend that we are angels. He condescends to the infirmity of our nature in giving us his command. So we should pray for the necessities of life, bread. Origen, who wrote earlier than Chrysostom by about a hundred years, and, and Origen was always fascinated by the deeper layers of scripture. He emphasized the spiritual side of bread. After all, he points out, Jesus said, do not work for the food that spoils, but for food that endures eternal to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So when, whenever you pray for daily bread, you should be praying for your daily fill of Jesus. <coughs> Cyprian, another third century Christian, he lived in North Africa. He argued simultaneously for both. Daily bread, he said, may be understood both spiritually and simply because both meanings help us understand salvation. And then Cyprian points to the church's celebration of the Lord's Supper, which involves eating actual bread, the stuff that nourishes our bodies, but at the same time, it is fellowship with Jesus, the bread of life. I end up being like Cyprian on uh, this matter. I've always been a both and kind of guy. I'm the one who likes to have his cake and to eat it too. And everybody says, you cannot, you cannot do that. But I think when it comes to the mysteries of faith, it's often very possible to hold on both ends of a paradox. And actually, it's usually wise uh, to do so. And prayer is uh, one of the mysteries of faith, don't you think? In prayer, horizons change. In prayer, we enter into communication with an in incomprehensible God, enter into the life of that God, and so may come to see reality more fully even as we pray, praying changes our thinking. For instance, we may pray that line that we're going to look at next week. Forgive me my trespasses the way that I forgive the trespasses of others. And may have come into our mind some grudge that we hold against a person that we've not let go of. After which, uh, we pray for mercy and for strength to overcome that situation. And similarly, we may come into prayer thinking that the primary need that we face at the moment is that next meal, which, think about it, is rare for most of us, I think. But in the course of praying for daily bread, we realize that what we really need is an extra serving of Jesus. So let's allow for both today. Bread with a lower B, bread with capital B. Let me talk for a minute about physical bread and why this seems to be an important line of the prayer. One of the early challenges for the church 
was a religious, philosophical movement. It was actually a collection of move movements that came to be known as Gnosticism, G-N, uh, oh, gnosis in Greek means to know, it's knowledge. And the Gnostics saw, uh, they were heavily under the, Greek, uh, under the influence of Greek philosophy and they saw humans as uh, a good spirit, bad flesh combination. The good spirit was trapped in the evil body and the goal was to escape uh, the body. Uh, oddly, the Gnostics divided over the implications of that. What do you do about that? Some of them uh, were very harsh with their bodies, denied themselves food and stuff like that. Others said, hey, you know what? Since our body doesn't matter, we can do anything we want to with it. And, and uh, they went a couple of different routes. But, but I think that notion of, of what human beings are does not fly at all in what I would call the faithful streams of Jewish and Christian thought. Because to both Judaism and Christianity, body and spirit are parts of a united package. Sort of like, like what I talked about last week, I mentioned how the cosmos of creation was heavens and earth, not two completely separate things, uh, you know, with huge space between them. They were part of the same package. And same with humans. The soul, and whenever I hear the word soul, my mind goes immediately to the word person. I don't know if we've got a better way of translating soul than person. The soul, the person, is always a body-spirit combo. Uh, the one needs the other. You take away one of them and you ruin the other is how it goes. And interestingly, what does the New Testament say we look for at the end of time? Not that we will all fly around as ghost-like figures, but rather at the resurrection we are given new bodies. Imperishable, bo imperishable bodies, so bodies that are different, but bodies, the never, bodies nevertheless. Uh, I don't know exactly what that looks like or how it works, but to me that idea is a lot more appealing that, than thinking we spend uh, all of eternity like Casper the Friendly Ghost just flittering around uh, somewhere. Bodies matter. Uh, think about this. Flesh is capable of housing God. Uh, that's the incarnation, right? God enters the world in the flesh, in Jesus. Uh, if embodied life was inherently evil, then the incarnation could never uh, have happened. Uh, the Apostle Paul will go so far as to say that our bodies, this flesh tent, is a temple. It's the tabernacle in which the Holy Spirit resides. So, flesh may have weaknesses. Flesh has limits. But it is part of what we are. And it is a gift of God. And because flesh matters, we can pray for what it needs. Uh, food. And then if you take food as just the tip of the iceberg, then extend it out into all other directions. We legitimately pray for rest so that we might function well, especially after today. What we'll go through today, we will pray for extra good rest uh, tonight, we pray for our health so that we might effectively do what God calls us to do. We pray for our safety 
so that we might be around to do the work that God calls us to. Uh, Christians are, are, know what happens in the end, but we're not looking forward to getting there ahead of the uh, appointed time, right? Now, bread matters. But just a couple of thoughts on praying for small b bread. First of all, that qualification in the prayer of daily bread is uh, interesting, even a little bit intimidating. It should be for us, I think. Give us just what we need for today, and we pray that with our cupboard, cu cupboards all stacked full of stuff that's going to take care of us for, for the next week or so. Uh, praying this prayer seriously might, in fact, lead us to living simpler lives, lives more trusting and dependent on God's daily mercies. And secondly, I want you to notice that the prayer, we've already talked about this a little bit, but the, the Lord's Prayer is given to us in the plural. It's a prayer that we pray together. And what does it mean for a group to pray that line of the prayer. Who is the we, the us, the our? I would suggest that faithfully praying the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples cultivates an ever-widening circle of who the we is. As I pray, I'm led not just to think about my daily bread, but led to think about the daily bread of all those who follow Jesus, even the bread of those who don't follow Jesus, because their flesh matters too. And it's not surprising at all, especially in light of the prayer, that one of the facets of Christian mission through the centuries has been food relief. The book of James talks about the hypocrisy of a person who says to the cold and hungry person, hey, go in peace, be warm and well fed. But then that, that hypocrite does nothing about it. Real love takes the shape of helping people meet their needs. And many of the missions that New Hope supports deal at least in part with food. The International Disaster Emergency Services, it takes uh, on a ministry of crisis care and, and very often that takes the form of food, providing food for people who have faced a natural disaster or been displaced uh, because of war. We're currently looking to host the food packing night sometime in 2024, probably as we get farther into the fall, but we've done those before where we pack the actual food that will go to people whose need for food is very grave. We used to take mission trips to Vida Nueva in Pedras Negras, uh, Mexico. And one of the things that we did on a daily basis was provide lunches for the kids from the orphanage, but also the kids from the wider community that came in. Our cooperation with the, the local ministry called Love Chapel is based largely on food. We share what we have in abundance with those who have a food need. And those missions, as well as others, minister to the flesh of human beings who, because of God's mercy to us, have been drawn into the we that we pray for. So there's a brief review of the physical side, the small b. But for anybody who's grown up with the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's hard to control your imagination when the word bread is heard. 
Father Abraham showed hospitality to his three visitors in Genesis 14 by sharing what with them? Bread. And then manna, that mysterious bread that came down out of the heavens, appears daily for the Israelites on their journey through the desert. Worshippers in Israel took bread, these, these uh, cakes of grain, to the altar to sacrifice to God on a regular basis. Jesus took five small loaves of bread and he broke them and he fed 5,000 people. We're getting spiritual here, folks. Jesus regularly befriended sinners and outcasts by breaking bread with them. His last meal with his followers included the bread of a Passover meal. After his resurrection, his followers, they were dining on a beach. You remember that story? They did not recognize him until he broke the bread. It seems that Jesus has some kind of connection with bread that is recognizable. And of course, out of the Last Supper comes the bread of communion that we ingest every single week in memory of him and in anticipation of the banquet that we will all enjoy in the heavens. And each of those moments points to something more than just a simple grain product. Bread in most cultures is a symbol of life, love, uh, hospitality, communion, gift, nourishment, joy, and for believers, bread is Jesus. The Jesus who says, I'm the bread of life, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And so if in praying for the bread, your mind is drawn away from your breakfast and your lunch, and your dinner, and to the Christ who is actually the bread of life, I think you will be forgiven. I think both and wins out on this line of the prayer. Each week as we go through the prayer, we're remembering some, uh, some character from the Christian past who was known for their praying and for the kind of life that they lived. Today, I offer up to you Elizabeth of Hungary. Hungary would have been worked, worked too, but uh, of Hungary, who was known both for her love for Jesus and for the way she took care of the poor. Uh, uh, Elizabeth of Hungary was born, you might have guessed this, in Hungary, right? And uh, she was the daughter of a king. This is the beginning of the 13th century. Among the drawbacks of being the daughter of a king in that day was the fact that there's a likelihood of you being married off for political purposes. And that was Elizabeth's fate. At the age of four, she was betrothed to Ludwig IV, the nine-year-old son of the king of Thuringia, that's north in Germany and she was sent away to grow up in the royal court there until the two would reach marrying age. Uh, and it actually was maybe a little bit better than most arranged marriages like that. The two kids actually liked each other, so that's a good thing. But just a couple of years into her new uh, place, she learned of uh, the murder of her mother, a politically motivated murder back home, and the news of that completely broke her heart. And at that event, she took refuge in Jesus and she took refuge in the comfort of prayer. Joy returned to her life when she was officially married to Ludwig. That would have been at age 14 or 15, sort of creepy. 
Uh, they were happy together, they began a family and all that, but besides her love for her family, Elizabeth had developed this passion for the poor. Uh, she often sold pieces of jewelry and clothing to provide uh, food for people who needed it and to take care of others. She wasn't above using the royal treasury to help either. Her husband generally backed her work, but sometimes it was a little bit of a test. On one occasion, he saw her going to the door with a covered basket, and oh no, he thought, another one of her crazy benevolence baskets. But when he pulled back the cover, it was a basket of roses. Who knows how many free passes she got after that mistake of, of his. And that's why in the religious art that depicts Elizabeth, she's usually portrayed either with a basket of bread or a basket of roses. You never know. When she was just 19, Thuringia was struck by disease and floods and then famine. And Elizabeth and her husband, the king, led relief efforts. Elizabeth had a hospital built that was said to care for about a thousand poor people per day. Then Ludwig unexpectedly passed away from an illness when she was only 20. It was a crushing blow, but he vowed not to marry, or she vowed not to marry and to keep up her care of the poor. And she did that steadily for the next four years. And then in 12, uh, 31, at the very young age of 24, she passed away from an illness. Only a quarter century of life and yet quite a legacy in that time. And I think her life it's, itself suggests that maybe this line of the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, can start in either place, capital B, small b, and work the other uh, direction. We enter the prayer thinking of material bread, but we are eventually led to Jesus, the bread of life. Or we come in knowing that Jesus is our bread, but as we gaze on him, into view comes all these people that Jesus loves and who are in need of basic nourishment. So I would tell you today, to pray the prayer however you want, right? It might not matter. But maybe pray expecting for your horizons to be uh, widened because whenever we pray, we encounter God in all his fullness and I think that is bound to happen. Prayer has a way of changing how we see things. Any advice on how exactly to pray. I would say if you're not sure how to pray, I would take this prayer and work through it. You know, it covers important territory, the territory that Jesus thought was important. Take it, pray it regularly, pray it slowly, thinking about what you're praying. Pray it with an open mind so that when other things invade your spiritual space, you'll be aware of that. The other thing I would say is maybe even more, is maybe even more simple. Uh, pray it in Jesus. Be in Jesus when you pray it. Some people, you can find this on the internet that God does not hear the prayers of all people, but only special people. You can find a lot of that stuff. And I think, what kind of God are we talking We're talking about the God who sends rain and sunshine on everybody. I don't know how he handles prayer exactly, but I doubt that he does not hear at all some prayers. But there is a privileged place to be in prayer, and that is to be inside his son, to be baptized into Christ, and to have been filled with the Holy Spirit who actually resides in you as a prayer partner. And with him inside you, that helps uh, complete the package, right? If you've not that made that kind of decision, we encourage you to make it, be thinking about it. Give me a call, come forward as we sing, however you wanna handle it, but just 
come to Jesus. Let's sing.
my communion devotion today is from uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. This is after the re resurrection when Jesus appears to his disciples. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Prayer does not give you spiritual power. Prayer aligns your life with God so that he chooses to demonstrate his power through you. The purpose of prayer is not to convince God to change your circumstances, but to prepare you to be involved in God's activity. The fervent prayer of the people at Pentecost did not induce the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Prayer brought them to a place where they were ready to participate in the mighty work God had already planned. Jesus told his followers to remain in Jerusalem until the Spirit came upon them. The disciples obeyed his command, waiting for God's next directive. As they prayed, God adjusted their lives to what he intended to do next. As they prayed, a unity developed among them. For the first time, the disciples used scripture as their guide in decision-making. The day of Pentecost arrived, and the city of Jerusalem filled with pilgrims from around the world. When God released his Holy Spirit upon the disciples, he had already filled the city with messengers who would carry the gospel to every nation. Prayer had prepared the disciples for their obedient response. Prayer is a design to adjust you to God's will, not to adjust God to, you, to our will. If God has not responded to what you are praying, you may need to adjust your praying to align with God's agenda. Rather than focusing on what you would like to see happen, realize that God may be more concerned with, he, what, he, with what he wants to see happen in you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you for your plan of salvation. Thanking you for hearing our prayers for this time of communion. We ask that you open our hearts to your will. Help us to see your activity in the world and join you and to make our agenda your agenda. We just uh, praise your name and thank you for this time to celebrate you. For it's in his name we pray.
they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. 